Welcome to New Hope today, and I want to especially welcome our online people that are viewing us uh, right now live, and those who will be viewing us tomorrow on cable and some of the other channels that uh, we broadcast on. It's a great day. Welcome in the Lord as we worship and as we praise Him together. Some of you watching may wonder what exactly is my dress. Some people are already asked that. I had assumed that everyone knows what country this represents, but I discovered that's not the case. This is Indian dress, and um, I have lots of good friends here who give me costumes from different nations, and since this is the last of our series on dealing with intercultural challenges, I thought I would dress up a little and be a little more intercultural. Two boys were playing football on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., when suddenly a rabid dog attacked the younger boy. And the older one, they were near some, some construction that was going on, found a piece of wood aboard, and he managed to hit the dog on the side of the head so hard that he broke the neck of the dog and, and killed it. And there happened to be a Washington Post reporter just going by, and he ran up to congratulate the bravery of this older boy. And he said, I've already got the headlines, he says. Um, young Nationals baseball fan saves friend from vicious dog. Oh, said the boy, I, I don't support the Nationals at all. Oh, well, he said, young Baltimore Orioles baseball fan saves friend from vicious dog. He said, I don't, I don't support the Orioles either. What do you mean, he said? I thought everyone in Washington, D.C. supports the Orioles or the Nationals. What team do you support? He said, the New York Yankees. <laughs> oh, said the reporter, and he changed his headline to, uh, to, um, to read, um, Ruthless Child Destroys <laughs> Beloved Family Pet. <laughs> and one of the challenges we face in dealing with each other is the challenge of perspective. When I'm right, it's my perspective. When you're wrong, it's your prejudice. So remember that. It's always your perspective, but it's the other person's prejudice. And for them, of course, it's their perspective, and you're the one that's prejudiced. And I want to show you uh, one or two pictures here to illustrate kind of a dramatic way how depending where you're coming from, how you're going to look at things. When you come to sell your house, I just stay there for a moment. This is your house as seen by yourself. And of course, when you come to sell your house, you want how much for it? As much as you can get, right? So you, where you display all the best parts of it, it has you know, wooden floors, it has granite counters, and you tell all the most beautiful things about it because that's your perspective. Now comes your buyer. <laughs> now your buyer is wanting to get your house for as little money as possible. So he's going to say, oh, you've got a problem here, you've got a need to fix this, you know, the shingles off on this side of the roof. So he has a different perspective. Next slide. But your lender, has a whole nother view of what he thinks the house uh, might be worth. Can we have the next one? And then when the bank's appraiser comes out, people often quarrel at how the bank looks at your house and appraises it because you can't get a loan for higher than what the bank appraises it, and the bank doesn't want to give too high a loan. And then the next picture, <laughs> this is your house as seen by the local county authority who want as much money as they can from the tax that they're going to impose on, on your house. And you know that you've had to quarrel with them sometimes. Hey, prices have been coming down. Don't tax me so much. But it all depends on your perspective and where you are coming from. When I was editor of Ministry Magazine, um, which was the international journal for Adventist pastors in America and throughout the, the world, at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, I needed to get a new associate editor one, editor one time. Up to the, that time, over 60 years in existence, there had been no ethnic editors of Ministry Magazine, neither the senior editor or any of the assistant editors. So I decided that I wanted an ethnic um, editor. I wanted to make a change, and I wanted an African-American editor. So I started interviewing different individuals. One of them was Freddie Russell, who was a pastor in Ohio at that time. Many of you know him as the pastor at Miracle Temple in Baltimore, and then president of Allegheny West, now recently the pastor at Berean 
an Atlanta church. And um, I interviewed some others. One I gave a call to interview was Leslie Pollard. Uh, he declined to come for the interview. He is now the president of Oakwood University. So I was looking at some pretty good younger people back then, and then unexpectedly came into view another individual who had a long editorial background, John Fowler from India. He had been education director, edited the journals out there, and because I had never been trained as an editor, had never taken any writing courses, although I can do some editing, I am not an expert at it, I needed an associate editor who was really good at editing and each of these other people that I was calling I'd have to send off and get some some training so when John came into existence I said great and I nominated him and he became the associate editor the first ethnic uh, person to join the staff well when the regional conference presidents um, heard about this I received a letter from the chair of the regional conference presidents and I'll tell you a little more about who they are for those of you who don't know what the regional conference saying that since I had not selected an African American to be an associate editor they were going to boycott ministry magazine and no longer pay for it to go to all their staff and pastors so the nine regional conferences stopped receiving ministry magazine because I had not put one of their people in from my perspective I had fulfilled what I thought was the key to put an ethnic person in. From their perspective, I had failed and I had not put an African American in. And these are the challenges we face as a church, local church, um, international church, on how we balance all these um, competing um, needs. Now, I mentioned Freddie Russell's name. Can we have his picture up, the next one there? This was on the cover of Adventist Today. When he was the pastor at Miracle Temple, he wrote an article for the magazine Adventist Today in which he said it was time to disband the regional conferences, these are the black conferences in North America, and integrate, or we're the last place in the world that is not integrated in the Adventist church. Soon after that article was published, he got the call to be president of Allegheny West and went and became the president of a regional conference. But he didn't stay there very long. I haven't talked to him since he, he left as to why he decided he wanted to go back in, into pastoring. Let me give you a short history lesson here. In 1945, as the Second World War was ending, this country, America, was still in the heights of segregation. And the, the black pastors and leadership felt that they could reach more of the black, black population if they had their own organization, not just black churches. And so in 1944, the North American Division organized what were called regional conferences. And the reason they were called regional conferences were they covered the same territory as the white conferences, but because they didn't have as many members, they would cover several states. And of the um, nine unions in North America at that time, see a conference is made up, for those of you who are visitors who don't know uh, about Adventism, a conference is made up of a grouping of churches a union is made up of a grouping of conferences, anywhere from four to seven or eight conferences in a union. The unions then are the building blocks for the general conferences, Seventh-day Adventists. All the unions around the world field make up the, uh, the, the general conference. Six of these unions decided to have regional conferences. The other reason was not just because of the need to reach their own people better than what the white people have been doing, but also for leadership. They felt that there was so much prejudice that they would never have a chance to, to become leaders in the denomination, to become presidents of a, of a conference. Well, that was 45. Times have really changed now. Chesapeake Conference has black churches, Korean churches, Hispanic churches, white ch churches. Potomac Conference, our sister conference, the third largest church in the conference with well over a thousand members, 98% black, is in the Potomac Conference, not in the, in the regional conference. Three, uh, three of the nine unions are led by black presidents in this country. This union, Columbia Union, has had a black president. North American Division has had a black president. The president of the largest union is black. The president of the largest conference, Southeastern California Conference, is black, and I could go on. So that was part of the reason that, that Freddie Russell was saying we don't need all of this now because we have shown that 
No matter what your culture, what your skin color, you can rise and become a leader in the uh, North American division. I don't know if I mentioned has been led by a, a, a black president. So why has it not happened? Well, how, why didn't we integrate like South Africa? That's another whole story. It's very hard to make structural changes in the, in the church. And so we won't worry about all of that going out there. We will talk about here how can we continue to grow as a community that truly loves each other, understands, and accepts each other. Because one of the things I want to specify is that all of you out there are dirt. I'm dirt. We're just all plain dirt. And what's so valuable about dirt? Look, look. Look what it says in Genesis 2.7. God is creating the world. He's creating humans. It says, that Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. He made him from what? The dirt. He just took some ground, some dirt, and fashioned it up like a sculptor, breathed in, and suddenly there, there's a human being. So we are all dirt. And then when we die, what happens to us? Genesis 3.19. God's talking to Adam after they've sinned. He says, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return where? To the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, from dirt, and to dust, dirt, you will return. So as I was contemplating on that, I thought, well, I'll get some, get some dirt here. Okay, here's some white dirt. Okay, represents some of us here. Here's some brown dirt. That reps, represents some of us here, Hispanics, a lot of them can identify with this, with this color. Um, whoops, I won't get that one. I got some black dirt, all right? A lot of us can identify with that. And then I got multicolored dirt here. You can't see it, but I've got white, I've got brown, and I've got black all mixed up together because some of us don't know what we are. I remember when I was pastoring in Scotland and my two children, one was about four at the time, the other was three, they said, what are we, Daddy? Are we British or are we American? And so finally my older one, four, she says, I'll be British for Daddy and you, Heather, can be American for Mother. <laughs> so that's how they decided their culture and, uh, and, uh, and that nationality. Now, the interesting thing is, hardly anything will grow in white dirt. This is basically sand, and you go to the seashore, there's a few things that grow. You know what grows the best dirt, the best food and so on? It's black dirt. Okay, it's a lot more valuable when you come to gardening than this trashy white dirt <laughs> that we've got here. The point I'm trying to make is, it doesn't matter the color, we're all dirt. And we get so excited over it sometimes, you know, as if this dirt's more valuable than that dirt. No, the only difference is it's got a different color and it might be a little more nutritious than something else, but we're all made from the ground, from the original person. And we all come from Adam and then we come from Nor. Now, I've been told I don't pronounce Nor properly and that I'm supposed to say Noah. Is that right, Noah? All right, I'll try and learn, but in England we say no. And um, some of us put an R on the end of everything, and that's just a particular dialect there in, um, in England. When Paul was in Athens and preaching to the people of the gospel and explaining to them what God was like and who we are, he says this in Acts 17, 26. And he, God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. He has made what? We're all what? One blood. When the blood mobile comes out here to take blood, they don't ask what nationality you are or ethnicity, do they? The blood's all the same. All the nationalities have type A, all have type O. There's no discrimination there. Blood is blood. It doesn't know anything about, about color. And everyone in this sanctuary has the same blood running through their veins. That's why John tells us in John 3.16, 3, For God so loved the world, not the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the Americans, not the Mexicans. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That who? 
particular group, whosoever would believe, put their trust in him, will be saved and not have eternal death. That's our God. He's totally colorblind. But he loves the variety. You think if you went out in the field and everything was green, all the flowers were green, everything was green, how boring that would be. Think how boring it is if we're all the same color. I just love the variety, all the different colors that we have in our congregation. That's our God. And in heaven, I've often thought about, are we going to change our colors in heaven? I don't think so. Now, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, there probably would have been just one color, one language, you know, uh, throughout. And uh, you may have heard me say this before, but I know what the language uh, in heaven is going to be. Sorry, my Spanish friends here, you think it's going to be Spanish, but it's going to be English. There's no, no doubt it's going to be, and you know why, it's very simple. Americans won't learn any other language. <laughs> so poor God, you know, what, what's he got to do? He's got to go with the, with the most popular language they use around the world. Let's take a moment and see how Jesus related to different cultures. Because he's our pattern, he's our Lord, he's our savior, he's our master. And we're going to look at one group in particular, the, uh, the Samaritans. And to give you a little background before I get to this text, I need to tell you, and you know that each culture has, a, has some derogatory terms that they use to refer to another culture, right? In Scotland, where I lived for, for many years, the term for me, see, I'm really English. I've been trying to find some Scottish roots, but my brother hasn't gone far enough. He's doing the genealogy. So I am actually very English. But in Scotland, they, ca they called me a Sassanac. And S-A-S-S-E-N-A-C-H, -S 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 Assassinac. And Assassinac is a very derogatory term for English people. And they say, you Sassanacs go home. And they kind of scowl and so on when they use the term. In this country, I learned that one of the words that is very bad is nigger. And you call someone a nigger, that's not considered very nice. I've also discovered that blacks use it with each other if they want to put someone down amongst the, because they understand that that's really bad if they say it amongst their own, own group. So the, the Jewish people had the same kind of words that they use that we have today when they really want to stress something really bad. So with that background, Jesus is talking to the Jews and they're starting to argue with him. They don't like what he's saying. And in John chapter 8, 48, we find them responding. And they say, look at this. You Samaritan devil, didn't we say all along that you were possessed by a demon? See, it wasn't. Now, if you call someone a devil, that's pretty bad. But they didn't just call him a devil. They called him a Samaritan devil because that was even worse. Because they hated the Samaritans. So the worst thing you, you could say to someone was call them a Samaritan. They'd curl up and they'd get angry and upset. Just like the words that I just explained earlier. If you call someone by these words, people don't take it as a compliment. And can get very, very up, upset. Now you can imagine the shock with this little background. When Jesus is telling the story as recorded in Luke. And this leader, church leader comes and says, you know, who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells the story which we call the Good Samaritan. So he starts off, this man goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he gets robbed and he's beaten, they're also listening, yes we know it's a dangerous road. And then this priest comes along, but he looks at him and he passes on and doesn't help him. They say, tut tut, priests are supposed to help. And then a Levite comes along, he's uh, helping the priest and he passes by and they say, tut tut. Then this other man comes along and he's a Samaritan. Now, you don't fall out of your chairs when I say that. But given this background I've just explained of calling Jesus a Samaritan devil, when he said he was a Samaritan, just about everyone had a heart attack. Just about everyone collapsed. They couldn't believe it. There's no way that a Samaritan would come and help a Jew. And Jesus said, not only did he help him, he put him on his donkey, he took him to a motel, he took him to the local inn, he paid enough money to help him recuperate until he was back on his own two feet again. That was your worst enemy coming to help you, a Jew. You know, Jesus loved to tell provocative stories like that. If he was living today, uh, um, let's say 50 years ago in the height of segregation in the South, he'd tell of how a white man in the South was stopped at gunpoint, robbed and pistol whipped, 
Along comes a Southern Baptist white minister who passes him by and doesn't help him. Then comes a white Seventh-day Adventist pastor who passes him by and doesn't uh, help him. And then comes a black man who rescues him and takes him to a local motel and pays enough for him there. That would be a similar kind of situation as it was back there in Jesus' uh, day. Now it's interesting to note that the term Samaritan, or the, there are five stories of Samaritans in the Gospels. They are only found in Luke and John. Matthew and Mark ignore them totally. A lot of Matthew is based upon Mark. So Mark is kind of considered the first gospel. Matthew copied a lot from Mark and added a few other things. Why didn't Matthew and Mark? Well, Matthew didn't put anything in because his gospel was written primarily to Jews. It's full of references to the Old Testament prophecies. Luke, that records three stories, has no prophecies. He's not writing for Jews. He's writing for Gentiles. So for him, his audience talking about Samaritans is very, very meaningful because he's explaining how Jesus loved other people and how he loved all people. It didn't matter what culture, what race, Jesus was there um, for him. So the story of the Good Samaritan is found, uh, it's, it's found there in, um, in Luke. But before we get to the two more in Luke, there's one more in John. You remember John chapter 4. Jesus is on his way from... Jerusalem to Galilee. And you'll see this text, John 4.4. 4. He, Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. Had to go? No. Most self-respecting Jews would take a detour across the Jordan, go up the east side of the Jordan, and then they would cross back over into Galilee. They utterly refused to go through Samaria and have any contact with them. But here it says Jesus had to go through Samaria. They get to this village and the disciples go off to get food. Jesus is tired. He sits down by a well and this woman comes to draw water and they come back and they find him talking to this woman in John 4, 27. The next verse says, they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. And not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman. You just didn't talk with those kinds of, of individuals. But Jesus had no prejudices. He had made all people. He had made our blood, he made our skin, he fashioned us. He didn't have a favorite child. All his children were equally valid in his life. Let's look at the two stories quickly in, um, in, in, um, in Luke. He heals 10 lepers. He tells them to go to the priests because the priests had to certify that they no longer had any of the skin disease. So off they trot when suddenly one of them returns and falls at his feet and thanks him. And Jesus said, are you the only one? I said, I guess so. But Luke records that he was a Samaritan. The others were Jews who just took it for granted, but this Samaritan was willing to come back and thank this Jew who had healed him and taken time with him. And then the last story of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritans, the reverse is happening. He's coming from Galilee back down to Jerusalem. And he's again coming through Samaria, through that country. And he sends some people ahead to a village to find a place for them to start because they're walking and it takes a while even though the distances aren't huge compared to here in Palestine. It was still more than a day's journey to walk from Galilee down to Jerusalem. And when they get to that village, the villagers, knowing they're Jews, will have nothing to do with them. The Samaritans, many of them, were just as prejudiced and racist as the Jews were. It worked both ways. So here with these Jews coming asking for accommodation, no, we're not going to give it to you. And then we read this fascinating account here in Luke 9, 54 to 56. James and John are livid. Uh, remember, they have some anger issues. Uh, they're called the sons of thunder in the Bible. Notice what they said. Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up as Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, so they went on to another village. Now, how's that for friendliness? Okay, I don't like it. I believe in God. God's powerful. God, just burn them up. Now, that's a loving spirit, isn't it? That's a kind way to, to behave. Some manuscripts don't have Elijah in there. Um, and you remember Elijah, just very briefly, when the king was sent 50 soldiers and a captain to arrest him. Elijah, this is one of the tough stories in the Old Testament, 
He said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and burn you up. And flash, down comes a lightning bolt and all 51 are fried to a crisp. And the king doesn't learn. He's kind of a little slow. And he sends another captain with 50 more men who demands, I'm going to arrest you. You've got to come with me. And Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. Zap. They're all fried people. They're all dead with lightning strike. The king doesn't learn. He still sends a third captain with 50 men. But this captain's got a little brain, uh, quite a big brain. And he knows what's happened to the previous one. He gets on his knees. He said, oh, please don't treat me as the previous ones. The king has sent me to get you. Would you, would you please come with me? And Elijah says, fine, I will come with you. But James and John didn't learn from that third captain. Uh, they were there with, um, uh, the, the, they were just going to call vengeance down. They were not going to be polite in this way. You see, they were filled with the same prejudices that other people were filled. And the amazing thing is that the Christian church was built upon these men, full of prejudices, full of problems. Peter, who denied his Lord, who, who betrayed, James and John, and so on. But look what happened with the Christian church, and look how these people grew. And it's so comforting to know that God uses imperfect people. That God doesn't use, there are no such thing anyway as a perfect person. Now it's not to be an excuse to say, oh well, I'm imperfect so I don't need to change. No, God wants us to grow, but our imperfections does, does not stop God using us. Our imperfections do not stop God loving us. And when we come to Jesus, when we're full of Jesus, when we're looking at Jesus in the face, his love will just envelop us. And it, it, can, it takes time. It doesn't happen. Change doesn't. It's a lifetime of changing and growing in Jesus. But the more we spend time with Jesus, the more our prejudices will go away. A first grader went on her first day to a newly integrated school just after segregation was ending. And an anxious mother met her at the door when she came back. She said, how did you get on? How was it there at school? And she said, oh, mother, she said, I got to school and a little black girl sat next to me. Oh, said the mother in fear and trepidation. But she tried to ask calmly, and, and what happened? And her little girl said, we were both so scared that we just held hands all day long. <laughs> we just held hands all day long. And that's what God wants us to do as a church, as a community, is to hold hands all day long. And if we're holding hands, we're going to care for each other. Excuse me. We're going to love each other. Because this is what Paul writes to the church at Colossae. He says in Colossians 1.19, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. It's Christ's blood that unites us. It's not just Christ's blood that saves us. Christ's blood unites us, reconciles us to God first and then to each other because we're all one blood. We're all just dirt. We're priceless dirt. We're invaluable dirt. But we're still just dirt. So why do we get so upset and anxious because someone else's dirt is a little different color from my dirt? We're all one in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the, on the cross. Now I want to tell you a story as I end of what happens in the secular world should and more happen in the church. It was April 1969. Cornell University was experiencing some student riots. 100 black militants had taken over the student union and were threatening violence against the campus, against the professors, because they said there was, they were being treated as second-class citizens, there were no black study programs and so on for them. And one of the most rabid and strongest of the, of the militants, the most inflammatory, was a man by the name of Thomas W. Jones. In fact, he said that Cornell had only hours to live, that he was ready to lay down his life, and that racist faculty and police would be dealt with. The takeover lasted for 34 hours, but then ended peacefully. And as the students exited the building, Thomas W. Jones was the last to leave. And he left with a rifle in this hand because they had smuggled arms into the building. They were prepared to shoot and kill if, if they had been stormed, and a raised fist in the other hand. 
One month after that incident, James Perkins, the president, was forced to resign. But the faculty took note and they started to make changes. And Thomas Jones graduated one year later with a master's from that um, university. He was involved in helping them develop a black studies program into racial studies. He went on to get a job with TIAA-CREF. I haven't looked up to see what it means, but it was the world's and is the world's largest pension company with assets of $142 billion. He rose in the ranks of that company, Thomas, this militant firebrand, to become the president of that company. And in 1993, Cornell University invited him to become one of their trustees and sit on the board of that university. In 1996, exactly 17 years ago yesterday, May 4, in 1996, he endowed the university with a special $5,000 annual prize for the person who exhibited the best qualities of bringing races and groups together. And when he endowed that annual prize on the platform with him was James Perkins, the president who had been forced to resign 27 years before, and he named the prize after James Perkins. And in his speech, he, he, said, he said that, I simply feel the need to acknowledge about Perkins that he was an extremely decent man who had the courage to do the right thing in trying to help America solve its racial problems by improving educational access for minorities. And at the ceremony, Jones and Perkins sat side by side on the stage together. One-time foes, now totally reconciled, caring and loving each other. It shows that racial reconciliation is possible and something even more wonderful is also beautiful. Nothing more beautiful than seeing this rainbow coalition in this church, loving each other, growing in each other, dealing honestly with any challenges that might come. And at the end of time, when Jesus comes back to receive his people and we, we go to heaven, we have this wonderful description by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9. And John says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb, determined to be part of that crowd today. Amen.